screen. Welcome everyone. Thank you all so much for being here. I'm really honored to be here with you today. Um, and yes, I love working with technically gifted people like you. So this is exciting for me to be here with you. So my intention for this presentation is to introduce you to some of the root causes of imposter syndrome. Looking at the phenomenon from a micro to a macro perspective. And secondly, we'll discuss strategies for dealing with these feelings of inadequacy. And finally, we'll discuss how we, particularly women in male dominated fields can support each other and feel more empowered. Meet Christina Romero O'Reilly, an accomplished healthcare leader. Her LinkedIn post really struck me and I asked her if I could share it with you. One day she and her teenage daughter and her daughter's friends were perusing Christina's old yearbooks from ancient times, like the 1980s. And she came across a message one of her good friends had written in her yearbook. It said, you're the first and only smart Mexican girl I've ever met. Ouch. In her post, Christina says, this was written by a friend from AP and honors classes where I was regularly teased as being too Mexican, not Mexican enough, et cetera, et cetera. She goes on, even though I was voted most likely to succeed by my high school class, the messages I took away from not belonging about the violation of expectations of a smart Mexican were louder in my mind. I'm wondering if you can relate to this in some way. Um, Christina's story is really important because it hits on a lot of the root causes of why some of us experience, quote, imposter syndrome. And we'll cover those causes in a minute. But first, let me ask a few questions. <laughs> if you'll join me on Slido and tell me when you do something well, how likely are you to attribute your success to luck? All right, the numbers change second by second. But the point here is that um, when we often do that, we are not taking ownership for our own credibility and capability. And that's one of the tenets of imposter syndrome. So let's work on that today. Um, one more question. How often are you afraid to express your views because people might discover your lack of knowledge? Again, this is something that shows up in imposter syndrome um, where we, we hide, um, we think we're not knowledgeable enough. Um, and so we tend to not share what we know. Thank you so much, guys. That was great. Love this, love this. We'll come back to that and see what the, the results are. Um, moving on, so what is imposter syndrome? Um, the term imposter syndrome or imposter phenomenon was first coined in the late 70s by clinical psychologists who were studying high achieving women. And they observed that these objectively accomplished women secretly felt like frauds, like phonies, and that they somehow achieved their success through 
errors at a selection process or some other external reason. So it's that secretly feeling like you're a fraud, like you don't belong. Imposter syndrome is often triggered by times when we have high challenge, but low support and in environments where few look like us or have similar backgrounds. Working Mother Magazine found that one half of women of color surveyed plan to leave their jobs in the next two years because of feelings of marginalization or disillusionment. And this was this fueled their self-doubt and it, it made them question their role and their place in the corporate setting. How does it show up? Well, you know, objectively, when we look at workforce participation, um, we can see it in statistics. Uh, for example, about one half of science and engineering PhDs are granted to women. Um, women only make up about 29% of the overall science and engineering workforce. Um, another fun fact, women scientists had to produce two and a half times more research or publications to receive the same competence scores as their male applicants. And how does it show up for us? Well, we may procrastinate because we're fearful that we won't meet expectations. We may feel we have to be superwoman and represent our entire social group. We may get small and take and not take on challenges for fear of failing. We may not take credit for our good work, again, attributing our success to luck. And we may experience stereotype threats. So this, um, we've all heard the term stereotype and um, the definition from the dictionary is standardized mental picture that is held in common by members of a group that represent an oversimplified opinion, prejudiced attitude or uncritical judgment. So this is a term, stereotype threat is a term used to describe how people within marginalized groups have internalized these stereotypes to such an extent that it actually imp impacts their performance. Um, a couple, there's been several studies done. Uh, when study, students in France were reminded of their socioeconomic status prior to a test, those from the low income groups performed more poorly than not only those from high income groups, but also their peers in the control group. And the same sorts of studies have been done with girls and math, African Americans and verbal ability tests. Here's someone who's had to deal with feeling like a stranger in a strange land often. Um, a writer wrote, when she stepped onto the Princeton University campus from the Bronx, the future Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor says she felt like a visitor landing in an alien country. And for the entire first year, she was too embarrassed and too intimidated to ask questions. She's probably gotten over a lot of that, I would guess. So what are the root causes of this imposter syndrome? When we think about our own feelings about joining the club, it helps to look at this issue with a broad lens. It's not just your own feelings that drive, drive this imposter syndrome. There's a long history with systems in place. In truth, we don't belong because we were never supposed to belong. And our presence in a lot of our spaces right, as a result of years of struggle. So there are many reasons why we might not feel like we belong. At the broadest level, systemic bias exists. And this encompasses history, culture, ideologies that have systematically privileged one group over another. Male, other, white, other, wealthy, other, establishment, other. 
<clears throat> and our institutions have codified these biases through laws, governing principles, norms. And as we know, the discriminatory, discriminatory practices of institutions produce inequitable outcomes. Obviously, our interpersonal relationships play a very large part in reinforcing stereotypes and bias. These may be conscious, but oftentimes they're not conscious. And they involve things like language, actions, assumptions. There's something called second generation bias that I wanted to mention to you. This kind of bias is very subtle. It's not necessarily conscious and doesn't intend to do immediate harm but it creates an environment where women fail to reach their full potential because the environment in which we are working was set up with the values of the dominant culture or gender who built the workplace. And when we don't have many role models in positions of authority, the model of male leadership becomes the standard bearer. Have you, ever been told you need to develop your executive presence? Hear this a lot. If so, it's important to get super clear on what that means. Finally, how could we not internalize these societal and interpersonal beliefs that we live with? We begin to believe the bias is true, and we experience bias at multiple levels and you can see where it's kind of a reinforcing cycle. And our identity is our own story about our past, present and future. It is a story and one that we should revisit from time to time. You may be holding on to beliefs about yourself that are outdated and were developed a very, in a very different time in your life. I really encourage you to occasionally revisit your identity narrative and have it describe not only who you are now, but who you aspire to be. So when we talk about imposter syndrome, oftentimes these dynamic, dynamics of bias aren't discussed as contributors. Rather, we put the burden on the individual to adapt to the dominant culture and norms. So lest we think that imposter syndrome doesn't impact men, um, even Mike Myers, a uh, very successful actor and comedian, um, thinks the no talent police are after him. Okay. So let's talk about some strategies you can use to stem imposter syndrome. Do some self assessment, discover where you have blind spots, where you may have implicit or unconscious bias and actively work to dismantle those. Shift your focus to your unique expertise, your gifts. And if you don't have a why, a larger purpose, I encourage you to find one. But remembering your why is your, your bigger reason for existing and for what you're doing. And that can always, that can be our compass to navigate difficult situations. Put yourself in uncomfortable situations where you will learn and grow. In a Harvard Business Review article ca called Authenticity Paradox, why feeling like a fake can be a sign of growth. Hermione Ibarra says that, quote, outside, outside is key to growing as a person and as a leader. And what she means by this is it's when you allow yourself to experiment with new behaviors to challenge your habitual patterns of thought and action. And then put your intuition to the test. Our intuition is filled with assumptions, right? And things that have worked for us in the past. 
but try to test your assumptions and broaden your thinking about possibilities. I read a great book called The Leader's Guide to Unconscious Bias that I highly recommend. And the authors recommend four courageous steps we can take to challenge bias. The first is the courage to identify. You know, we spend a lot of our time in unconscious living and we need to, right? Because we need to get through the day. We need to tie our shoes and drive our car. And we don't need to think about every single step along the way. But so it's a very adaptive behavior. Um, and we've created mental models and assumptions that have, of what's worked for us in the past. But here's where potential bias can seep in. And so the authors are recommending pausing, noticing, and questioning your assumptions about people and situations. The courage to cope. If you are the recipient of bias, here's some tips for caring for yourself. Archery Lord, the African-American writer said that caring for myself is not self-indulgence, it's self-preservation. Journaling about your experiences can be very helpful as a way to get it out of your head and objectify it on paper. And also being with others in a community is helpful as well. And I really like this question um, that the authors suggest we ask ourselves. What would the most constructive response to this circumstance be that would support my personal and professional goals? It's always great, good to be clear about your own objectives and your desired outcomes. The courage to be an ally. We've heard this word a lot lately. Um, what does it mean to be an ally? I'm not an expert, but I'm relying on the wise thinking of others. My understanding of being an ally is that we're there to support others who may be different than us, may not have the same opportunities as we do, and hold them up. It may look like simply inviting someone to happy hour or a meeting or a conference that they would not normally be invited to. It might look like sponsoring a younger colleague in your organization um, so that you can help them learn the ropes and, and that they can have your support in reaching their full potential. It may simply be just listening, being a friend, the sounding board. The courage to be an advocate. Um, advocacy is tough, right? It, it may and it often moves the needle, but it's risky. And there's a couple of things that we can do to help as advocates. Share your own story. This requires vulnerability, but will allow others to better understand you and empathize. Speak up. This may look like challenging assumptions, maybe with a friend or, or at work even. And then, uh-oh, formalized dissent. Are we uh, talking revolution here? Um, so this looks like challenging organizational assumptions or more broadly held assumptions um, and seeing where there are gaps in a plan. You uniquely may see things that others don't because of who you are. We have a lot of, a lot of work to do. And with any of these challenges and courageous actions, I encourage you to be thoughtful. You don't need to burn bridges for the sake of being right, but build those relationships and find the right time to challenge. Another poll question. So when I'm, 
oftentimes when I'm in my coaching sessions with clients, I ask, what commitment will you make to yourself today? And this really helps solidify what we've learned about ourselves, as well as identify an action or change that we intend to make. So I'll ask you, what commitment will you make to yourself? I don't know if this is on Slido or not. So if it's not, I encourage you to write it in the chat. Oh, it's coming through. Yay. Conscious of my thoughts. This is really beautiful. Ah, oh, I love this. I am going to print this out later and um, just re remark on how how lovely that is. Wonderful commitments, folks. Thank you for sharing those with us. Um, when I was preparing this, re this presentation, I found that there were a lot of great resources out there. And so I've added some here that you can take a look at later if you're interested in, in diving deeper into this topic. Finally, let's take this advice from Shonda Rhimes, who's a Hollywood executive. She says, you belong in every room you enter. And if you don't feel like you truly belong, act like you belong. Thank you all for having me today. I look forward to chatting with you further. Thank you so much, Molly. That was mm -hmm. amazing and so inspiring. I can see the messages coming in the chat. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to add them in the Q&A. Uh, I see we have a question here. So Brenna is asking, what are some good resources or recommendations for discovering your why? <laughs> your why? Oh, I love that question. Thank you for asking. Um, yeah, so when I when I'm um, one of the exercises that I have coaching clients do sometimes is when they're trying to figure out what do I want to do with my life or what do I want to do next, and knowing your why is is really part of that. And part of so there's several dimensions to this. Um, I would say one is knowing what your values are. What are your core values? We're all different. Um, and, but understanding what, where, what are your North, what's your North star? You know, what, what are you living for? That is a very core and fundamental part of discovering your why. And then secondly, I would say, um, knowing what you're passionate about, what, what uh, gets your heart going, you know, what makes you, what, what are you passionate about? It might be, you know, an environmental issue. It might be whatever, 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 right. It could be a million things, but what is it that, that really sparks you? So that's part of it too. And then another part of it is really knowing what you're good at. What are your what are your unique strengths? And kind of bringing all of those together, you know, to say, okay, this is this is why I'm here. 
this is this is what I'm meant to be doing. And it's not going to happen instantaneously, but it's these are all good things to know, to know about yourself, to understand about yourself. Thank you. Um, also, Akila, I don't know if I'm pronouncing your name right, in the chat asked, how do we eliminate the thought, how will other people judge me if I ask this or that, especially in work environment? Um, I don't know if you can eliminate it, but I think practice is always um, good. And so starting small with something that um, you are, that you're not going to risk too much with, or even if you don't feel comfortable in a larger group, you can take it offline with someone who you feel comfortable with asking. Um, and you, and again, you may never get over it. Um, it's, 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 it really does take practice though. And, um, and recognizing that, and, and I know we've all heard this, but I think it's really true. Other people in the room are going to have the same question as you. And, um, so so take a chance, take a risk and ask um, and see what you find out. That's so true. Thank you so much. Okay, we have more questions coming. Um, let me see. How to build more confidence when you have no experience in the field you are trying to enter? Yeah, what a great question. Um, and I think here's where um, an organization like Women Who Code is so valuable because you can jump in and um, learn from others. There, there's This is such a wonderful sharing environment, this organization. Um, and so if you are interested in getting into an area that you don't have experience in, but you think you have interest in. Um, I would suggest getting involved in groups like this. You also could volunteer your time. So sometimes we don't have the experience on our resume or we don't have the, um, we never actually had a formal job, but if you've done volunteer work um, in different areas related to what you want to do, that demonstrates that you're capable of doing it and that you um, you have demonstrated it. So um, I would really encourage you to, to find an opportunity to, to share that skill or that knowledge that you have. Awesome, thank you. Okay, another question. As a manager, I see a lot of people with imposter syndrome. I know how good they are, but they don't feel the same. How do I help them in a real way without just being a, a cheerleader? <laughs> I, you know, I have to say that um, I've had some phenomenal managers in my career and um, the ones who believed in me are the ones that stand out um, and um, who and who would just tell me, no, you can do this, you know, Molly, I know you can do this and I, and I have your back. So knowing if, if an individual um, isn't feeling comfortable with taking on a challenge, um, again, start small and reassure them that you will be there to, to catch them if they fall, um, that failure is okay, if it is okay. Um, and again, you know, ask, you could ask them, what is it about the challenge that is uncomfortable for them and see if there are specific tools or knowledge or skill. There's a gap there. There might be a gap and, um, that you could help fill. Absolutely. I used to manage a team of user experience designers 
And yes, I always told them like, okay, next time you will be presenting to the client, for example. So just inviting them to take the challenge. I think this is a very good idea. Yeah, that's well. great. Great advice. Okay, another question. Uh, how to stay motivated when applying to jobs and interviewing for your first developer job after coding bootcamp? Hmm. That's very specific. I'm going to broaden it a little bit since I'm not a developer. Um, but I think, so it sounds like you, you've gotten some education, gotten some skill building, and now you're applying for positions. Um, and, it, you know, applying for jobs is um, very complex uh, these days, right? Um, you have to have the skills, you have to have experience, you may have to know somebody. Unfortunately, that's part of our world that we live in. But um, what I would suggest that you do is really um, make sure your LinkedIn profile is um, up to date and that you've got lots of connections and there are other ways to build connections in the industry as well. But knowing um, kind of what companies you're targeting and then um, identifying if possible a couple of contacts in those companies is really helpful so that you can build those bridges there um, and not just be a um, you know a random resume that comes through and is uh, the AI machine reads the keywords so you want to to the extent possible um, see if you can find contacts within companies you want to work for. Um, and be confident about what you're bringing to the table. What, what can you offer that company? Make sure you're able to clearly articulate that. Thank you so much. Another question, uh, what if you are your own worst enemy and you have support? but it is so hard to believe when someone compliments you. What should be the first step to take? Hmm. Well, I would just suggest a little exercise. Um, and that is writing down, just taking some time to journal and write down all the things that you do well. It's kind of starting with yourself and saying, okay, um, it's hard for you to hear compliments, but let's start complimenting yourself. So really find those areas where you're truly, you have a unique skill set or you've done something really well or you do something really well. Um, and it could be so many different things, um, but I'd like you to write those down and and have that available to you to sort of boost your your um, your confidence in your your own abilities and capabilities. I don't know if you have heard, but we have the uh, Upload Her initiative in Women Who Code. So we share with one another our own achievements, and you know oh. also oh. our colleagues' achievements. And this is so nice because. They can tell you what you are doing great that maybe you don't realize, but the others do. And nice. this is so great. Yeah, so great. If, if you can join the Women Who Code communities, they are all digital. And you can see, you will see many women talking to you and, and talking about your successes. Well, so thank you great. for that. Yes. Okay, um, I see also many messages in the chat. They are asking about the slides. We will uh, we are recording this talk and we will be uploading it to YouTube so you can find it. Uh, I think in a couple of weeks. Um, then we have another question. Let me see how to confidently ask precise question or express ideas in a large group of audience without fear, especially when executive folks are there. Yeah, well, this is where, um, you know, you um, want to get a hold of the agenda before the meeting. 
and know what's going to be discussed or try to anticipate what's going to be discussed. And um, identify what you already know about these subjects or, um, or need to know and formulate those questions in advance. You know, even though at the moment, in the moment, you may need to, you will need to tweak them, right? It's, but to practice beforehand, asking, um, even looking in the mirror and doing that um, can be helpful. But um, knowing that you're in that room for a reason is, is helpful as well. There's some reason why you were invited to that meeting. There's some expertise or knowledge that you have that there that, that you're being asked to share and so um, even the big executives don't know all the details and all of that you know about your work so and they need you for it so try to keep that in mind as you um, temper your feelings of intimidation. <laughs> Thank you. Any more questions? We have a couple of minutes before we finish. I know it's late for some of you. Okay, one more question. Uh, dealing with this imposter syndrome and unemployment gaps, so keep getting rejected from jobs. Hmm. Okay, that's tough. Um, yeah, so that that hurts your confidence, right? When you um, don't get the offer. And um, so, you know, I would suggest that you um, kind of examine where things are breaking down in the process. If it's your resume is not being read or seen or taken up by the company, um, or if it's an interview, situation that you might need to practice a little bit more. Um, and it may, may take some time. Um, and so as much as you can keep in contact with your network and also, as I mentioned before, giving, giving of yourself, keeping yourself in the game in some way, um, will help you continue to have that confidence that you can do the work. Thank you. Okay, and in the chat, I see this question. This is very interesting. Does imposter syndrome ever go away? <laughs> um, who knows? I, I don't know. I think we can work on it. You know, I tried to provide some tips on how to minimize it, but um, it could pop up here and there in the future as well. So I, I think it has to do a lot with, um, it might have to do with circumstances or other, other things. But the thing is, once you begin to practice some of these things and realize what's happening, when you start to feel that way, you can kind of stop, pause and say, hmm, um, I think this is me making some stuff up here. And um, so let me reframe this. Let me think about this in a different way. And, um, and that can help, but I don't know if it ever goes away. Fake it till yeah. you make it method. I like yes. that. Janet. <laughs> That's a really good one. Okay, so thank you so much, Molly, for joining us today. Your talk was so inspiring and so good. Um, just to remind everyone, we have a replay section. So if you come here after the event ends, you can watch this session and all of the others again. Uh, and then we will upload it to YouTube anyway. So thank all you so right. much for Thanks joining Thanks so much. Us. Thanks, everybody. Bye bye. Thank you. See you in the stage in five minutes to finish the event, the first day of the event. Bye. Bye.